we'll just get right into it, shall we? Because we're talking about chimeras, which is, there's just, all of modern science will call chimeras a, uh, just a myth, that they're all myths. Well, it's a myth. If we're, if we're going to have to use that terminology, which we don't have to, but I mean, <laughs> I don't think it's personally, I don't think they're myths at all. Um, because modern, I'm going to show at the end of this how modern science is even starting to try to replicate these myths. But um, if we were going with that terminology of, or that that ridiculous um, narrative that is pushed on us by evolutionists and certain types of academia that claims, oh, well, the ancient chimeras were just a myth. Okay, well, then all of the ancient cultures had the same myth. How about that? That's weird, isn't it? They all had the same myth? All the same types of myths that's interesting you think a different people group who spoke a different language had a completely different culture and lived thousands of miles apart might develop some different mythos but apparently humans just aren't that original so they all had the same myths isn't that interesting so as you probably have been noticing throughout the last five parts of this series we we start to show all these great extensive parallels between uh, the systems, the rulers, the places, all, all the concepts of the ancient world. Because remember, as we've talked about with great depth, Babylon was where all the all the people of the world came together. The first Babylon that built the Tower of Babel. And this is, they you know, tried what they did. The father came down with the angels and interrupted what they did, dispersed them with different languages. But he didn't kill everyone that was a part of that project. So you have now they're they're all still have this, you know, I doubt a lot of them repented. It doesn't seem like it as we look at history. So now they go to their own cultures. They're still practicing the behaviors of Babylon, the religions of Babylon. They're carrying on the quote unquote mythos of, of what Babylon had, as we've shown in multiple presentations, how these, these ancient gods were being worshipped at the Tower of Babel. So with all that said, a lot of people's, I think, I think growing up in church, a lot of people have this idea that the Tower of Babel was like a one-time idea. And then all the people that, that, you know, when, when the tower fell and the, all the people were dispersed back to the lands, they just stopped being rebellious towards God somehow. But that's not at all the story of ancient history. Um, they continued with their bad behavior, the ones that were still alive and just carried it on in their culture under, under a different language with different artistic expressions. It's a, uh, so this series is digging into the idea of we're looking at all the concepts of ancient Babylon would be the Babylon that the Old Testament prophets um, would have been living in and around, as we've discussed in our first few parts where we talked about Abraham's, you know, his his world that he lived in, because um, he's in that same generation when the Tower of Babel was destroyed. And then, of course, we're going to go into the present and future parts of this series. We'll look at present day Babylon and all of its um, incarnations, all of the different avatars, if you will, of this same system and the same religion. And but it's all I'll show you how it's uh, pushed into the present day. And then we'll jump into prophecy and look at mystery Babylon of the future. So I really hopefully this has been an edifying series and I, I hopefully you'll stick with us till the end. So Jubilees 5, 1 through 3, and it came to pass when men, when the children of men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the angels of God saw them on a certain year of this Jubilee, that they were beautiful to look upon. They took to themselves wives of all whom they chose, and they bare unto them sons, and they were giants. And lawlessness increased on the earth, and all flesh corrupted its way, alike men and cattle and beasts and birds and everything that walks on the earth. All of them corrupted their ways and their orders. They began to devour each other, and lawlessness increased on the earth, and every imagination of the thoughts of all men were thus evil continually. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, and all flesh had corrupted its order, and all that were upon the earth had wrought all manner of evil before his eyes. So most of you guys recognize this is Jubilee's parallel passage with Genesis 6, 1 through 5, actually technically 1 through 13. And and you might be asking, but wait, Sean, that was before the flood. Like after the flood, what are, what are we talking about? It, it maybe, maybe they had some strange things before the flood. But what about after the flood? Well, we've gone in, in parts three where we looked at the post-flood giants. Um, go back and check that episode out, and I show you the idea of how they picked up the same practices that the watchers, the rebellious angels that taught mankind before the flood. Remember the hierarchy, rebellious angels, as we just read, they, they took wives, they had giants as for children, 
and I go into the science of how that's possible. They taught the giants that occultic theology before the flood. The writings of the watchers relating to worship of idolatry connected to the omens and the stars in the heavens, which is what Deuteronomy 419 tells us not to do. That information was found carved into rocks in Jubilees chapter 8, 1 through 4 by a specific guy named Kenum, who's in Genesis chapter 10 in the Septuagint and also in Mary chapter or in Luke chapter 3 um, in the genealogy of Mary. So this guy who's a part of the descendancy, a part of that, those couple generations after the flood, the grandchildren of Noah, this guy named Canaan, or Kenum, depending on the, the Greek transliteration, he found the, the carved writings of the watchers that were carved into rocks and started practicing them again. And then lo and behold, mass unrighteousness starts happening. Warfare starts happening. The giants start emerging again. And then you have the Tower of Babel beginning as well. So this is where the occult practices start picking up again. So with that said, so does everything that was going down before the flood. They start doing it again after the flood. And in fact, the purpose of the Tower of Babel is Genesis 11 uh, and Jubilee's uh, 11 states was to get to the firmament to war with God so that may create a name for themselves. That means they have to get the person who's over them, the person who has a name over them, the person in rulership over them. You have to remove them from that name, from that rulership so that you may make a name for yourself. So the general command through Noah from God was that all the descendants of Noah would go spread upon the earth to the land that was apportioned to them. And that is expounded to us with great detail in Jubilees 8 and 9. But some of them, many of them, specifically Canaan and the sons of Ham, they didn't want to do that. They didn't want to be spread upon the earth. They wanted to get to the firmament, take out the father so they could be their own boss, basically. I'm trying to give you the modern vernacular to shorten it. So this is what we're seeing. All their behaviors that was going before the flood that caused great judgment, <laughs> they pick it right back up. Part of that behavior was what we have on screen here in red. They corrupted their ways and their orders. Yes, there were more giants after the flood, just like before the flood. Yes, lawlessness increased in great ways. All flesh was being corrupted. Men, cattle, beasts, birds, and everything that walks on the earth. They were sinning against the animals, insects, the birds, the beasts, everything too. They corrupted their ways and their orders. You guys remember in, you guys remember in, um, uh, what was it, you know, like uh, physical science class or biology class, you know? Uh, what was it? Do you guys remember, put it in the, I'm sure, I'm sure somebody remembers this in the chat. So put it in the chat. If you remember the actual order, was it kingdom, phylum, um, genus, species? I can't remember the, I, if you guys remember, put it in there, but it was the, the hierarchy that's called the ordering structure of uh, biological entities on, on that are known to mankind. Um, put it in the chat. If you know what I'm talking about, I don't remember off the top of my head. <laughs> it's been too long. So, they pick up this this right after the flood as well. They're corrupting the orders of all things, the practicing occult theology, which goes, this is a part of cult theology, is mixing together species. Centaurs all over the ancient world. This is in ancient Greece. Half man, half horse. All over ancient Greece. Half man, half horse. They even use them for battle. Centaurs. Had them on coins, centaurs. Had them on pottery, artistic pottery. Oh, there it is, David Shearer. Sure, of course you remember, brother. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, yeah. So the point is the biological entities were being disrupted. Thank you, West Blaze. So here in the ancient Greek world, they talked about these types of mixtures, not just with other animals, but also with mankind themselves. Centaurs is what they call them. Supposedly, they would even use some centaurs as actual pulling horses for chariots for the quote unquote Greek gods. They used them in battle. They used them in battle as well. Satyrs were also in ancient Greece as well. I have them on pottery. We actually have satyrs mentioned several times in scripture. One of the times it's actually talking about Babylon. 
and it says in Isaiah 34, 12 through 14, it says, Her princes shall be no more, for her kings and her great men shall be destroyed. Thorns shall spring up in their cities and in her strongholds. They shall be inhabit they shall be habitations of monsters in the court of ostriches. Devils shall meet with satyrs, and they shall cry one to the other. There shall satyrs rest, having found for themselves a place of rest. And guys, this translation I, that you're reading is from the Greek Septuagint. The Masoretic will say it different, and especially with all the different translations that have been built upon the Masoretic um, in the last hundred years, they they try to modernize it. But the you know the most the oldest manuscript that we have through the Greek Septuagint claims that there were satyrs, and there is a definition for the word satyr. It is half man, half goat. It's half man, half goat. They also usually had little horns on their head and they had a tail and they had, you know, goat like feet um, to some degree, very hairy under under uh, leg areas. Half man, half goat. You'd have a tail. They're also uh, part like in ancient Greece, one of them was called Dionysus. When the Romans took over, they call him Pan. So it's kind of a an ongoing thing that was always associated with uh, lasc lasciviousness, lewdness, uh, partying, um, immorality sexual morality and supposedly it also have the little ears you have little goat ears with some of the satyrs you have ancient greece talking about all types of chimeras i didn't actually they have an entire list in ancient greece of all types of different strange creatures that were hybrid creatures i just didn't have uh the time to go through them all because i'm covering multiple different countries but it wasn't just mixing animals together it was mixing man with animals as well and as we go into Babylon in the present day, I'll be showing you how they're doing that in the present day as well. And it's actually, it's literally their stated goals. <laughs> it's not even just speculation. It's not like, oh, some conspiracy website. It's literally been stated by uh, organizations that um, heads of state, you know, give credence to. So, so if we keep going here, we go now to Egypt. So in ancient Egypt, the scorpions were, you know, the scorpions were extremely um, valued, I guess, if you could put it like that. They considered them a symbol of magic and power in ancient Egypt. And so the scorpion was often associated with the rulers. There supposedly was the great scorpion king. Um, if this is a disputed fact in ancient history, uh, ancient Egyptian history that one of Egypt's first great kings was called the Scorpion King. And guys, just in case you're wondering, that little hat that he's wearing, that little conical-shaped hat, that was called the White Crown. Um, and that was associated with pharaohs. As you can see, he's a giant. He's bigger than everybody else around him. There's a scorpion right in front of his face um, because he was the one in control. He was in power. And supposedly the first great king of early, early Egypt um, was called the Scorpion King. So we also have a god named Selket. I think I'm saying that name right, ancient Egyptian. Selket. She was the, uh, a goddess that was half scorpion and half woman. As you can see, she's got the, the Molech, the bell horns above her. Um, she's got the, uh, the serpent on top of that little statue on top of her head. Um, clearly, she's got a scorpion body on the backside. But then she's also inside those little bell horns. She's got the, the disc, the sun disc of Ra. So this is all of it is 100% Egyptian. You got Egyptian hieroglyphs on this artifact they found on the little table that she's laying on. Um, this is one of their ancient Greek, or excuse me, Egyptian goddesses. I think her name was Selkit. Very interesting, interesting depiction of an ancient goddess. And in fact, there's different types of scorpions. They, the Egyptians um, revered the water scorpion, which is why the design of the tail is a little bit different than a land-based desert scorpion. But then there is even this ancient statue, which has a water scorpion on her head. Again, a symbol of power in the ancient world, specifically ancient Egypt. Now we'll move to ancient India. This is where it gets interesting. It's always interesting to me. I just say that to me, um, this is really far away from Greece, really far away from Egypt, not very far away from Babylon, but this is, you know, the, the ancient India seemed to have their own thriving culture. They have some of the oldest written documents um, in the world 
uh, with their ancient religious texts. And, you know, incredible architecture, incredibly large uh, society that flourished. And But sometimes in American Western culture and history classes, ancient India gets overlooked. We just focus on ancient Greece and ancient Rome and sometimes ancient Egypt, that kind of stuff. But ancient India shared a lot of the same beliefs, had similar gods. There's a scorpion god um, from ancient in India called Kamala. I think I'm saying her name right. Kal excuse me. Kal I said that wrong, didn't I? Sorry. Kalama. <laughs> She's a Hindu scorpion goddess. And this is an actual hieroglyph of her in battle or something like that. Um, and she's just that's they actually do a a um let me let me see if I can put this on screen real quick. They actually do a ritual every year in India where they eat scorpions. Um put this on screen for us. They eat scorpions in this ritual. It's a it's a religious festival uh, where they allow the, the scorpions to crawl on their heads and they eat them. You guys can see that, I believe. And then this is all in, in homage to this ancient goddess. And also to also to Naga, which was a supposedly half serpent, half human god who lived in the underworld. Yeah, it's pretty gross. I'm sure there's people in the audience right now freaking out. But they mess with scorpions. It's pretty crazy. And it's all of a, a, a big, you know big ritual to the yeah miss marcia i didn't there's so many there's so many in every culture you're right yeah you've got i think his name is hunan or hunan he was half elephant um half human there's also half monkey half human in ancient india as well um there's the, all types of the, i mean there's some people think that there were half uh fish half men in ancient india as well so like there's so many i just had to like kind of slim it down for the sake of the broadcast um but ultimately just trying to show you guys some great parallels to all the ancient culture believed and worshiped these things. So they were considered gods and goddesses and it wasn't just simply, um, it wasn't just simply them making comic book heroes and getting excited about them. They, they did ritual sacrifice and killed people in res, as a result of these things. They did horrific stuff at these occultic practices in honor of these gods that were half animal half insect half human whatever pick your pick your mix you know what i'm saying like there was a supposing ancient egypt there was a you know anubis he's half dog half man then you have this other uh, crocodile or crocodile god that they would consider half god half man uh, it's just it's all over the place um with how they revered these people so a lot of people actually um a lot of people actually theorized that in leviticus 17 where Yahweh is telling the children of Israel who've come out of Egypt, because remember Leviticus 17 happens after Exodus 32. Exodus 32 is where they put up a, a calf, the golden calf, and started worshiping it in rebellion. But then in Leviticus 17, God is revealing to the Israelites, I don't worship, want you doing sacrifices out in the desert to goat demons. So a lot of people wonder, okay, were well, they just worshiping, you know, the idea of like Molech or Baal? In an in a version that looked like a, like a, the goat headed character, right? Or were these more like satyrs, half man, half goat? They were referred to as devils and demons. The satyrs were. So, it's very interesting. It's it's you know, uh, there was multiple places in Leviticus and Numbers and um, different places where you know there's like stop worshiping the goat demons. <laughs> That's not good. So it was rampant all throughout the ancient world. This is why Yahweh was trying to show his people who had kind of been in Egypt too long and uh, they weren't allowed to worship properly, which means the new generations now are being indoctrinated out of their religious beliefs and into the Egyptian beliefs, which is why they had so many problems when Moses and Aaron pulled them out of Egypt. There still had too much religion of Egypt, which is the same religion of Babylon. It had too much of it in them. And as I showed um, in previous uh, previous episodes, Actually, my wife and I talked about this um, in our last meek, Milk and Meat when we talked about why did God destroy the Canaanites? Um, because there was actually an Assyrian Canaanite, or it was a Canaanite ruler who lived in Assyria who invaded Egypt and took over Egypt and started putting the Hebrews into servitude, according to Jubilees chapter 46. So it was um, the, the, whole, the whole region is connected. 
They just have a different language. So therefore, they have a different word for the same type of God that they're worshiping. The scorpion God and goddess concept is in all these cultures. So let's now go to Chaldea. Many of you understand that this is the, the technical name for Babylon. Babylon was a city and a kingdom. Chaldea was the geographical area. In ancient Babylon, that's Chaldea, they had men who were half scorpion, and they detailed it. They had men that were half men, half scorpion. Positions of power next to the king. Look like Looks like he's petting them right there. It's pretty weird. Checking their beard. I don't know. But this is not an actual, what they call a cylinder seal. So the little red thing I have highlighted on the left, if you basically rolled that out onto clay, it would produce these images. It was like the first uh, typeset, if you will. And this is, you rolled this one out and it shows you he's got multiple, multiple uh, on each side of him. He's got men that are half men, half scorpion. So it's pretty crazy. Pretty crazy. Nature shows us that it also can create hybrids without tampering, without intentional genetic alterations. It just does it naturally. And I don't know if you guys ever realized this or not. I didn't realize this until I was doing this research. But there's actually a mixture of a scorpion and a spider. Just in case you thought spiders weren't icky enough, they weren't creepy enough, they weren't deadly enough. Some of them have scorpion tails. So I just have to trust the father on that one. Ask him about that when I get to get to his house. Say, hey, come on now. No one likes no one likes spiders. And then you go ahead and put like a scorpion tail on one of them. What are we what are we doing down here? What 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 is this? And apparently, uh, this particular type of scorpion slash spider hybrid is uh, becoming a problem in Canada. So they're having to get extra extermination out to deal with them. Modern science has been genetically altering various types of animals and insects for years, years, guys. Let's look at some of these. Let's look at some of these tests that they've already. These are well known, well established. This is not fringe stuff. This is not conspiracy. This is well understood stuff. They've already in 2011, 2010, I guess. Um, 2010, they came out with a goat spliced with a spider. A goat spliced with a spider. And the whole point of it was um, they spliced the spider genes into goats. And then the chemical factories that make their milk also secreted spider silk protein. And the milk can then be processed to extract the silk. And this way they can actually have the silk in greater quantities because it's being produced by the body of a big goat instead of a little bitty spider. So what's not talked about well, it's kind of talked about up here but it doesn't go into great depth in this little bitty article but the idea was that they wanted to be able to put this extremely strong spider silk and i don't know i don't know if you guys realize this or not but spider silk by its tensile strength is some of the strongest in the world um so that's when it's like super little and a little spider's using it but if you made it human size it's some of the strongest stuff in the world and it doesn't easily break they wanted to make airbags out of it. They wanted to use it for sutures, and they wanted to use it for bulletproof vests as a part of a military experiment through DARPA. They wanted to mix spiders and goats, and they successfully did it. They just didn't mess with the genes that, that um, formed the face. So does this mean they could have successfully altered? They altered the interior milk production faculties of a goat to create something inside the milk faculties of a goat that's never that would never be happening naturally or normally so does that mean with further tinkering or with a different application they could give a goat the face of a spider it's crazy guys um this this of course talks about how they made some animals that were glow in the dark so it says we currently have genetically engineered Mice, sheep, rabbits, pigs, monkeys, dogs, cats, and fish um, that somehow glow in the dark. Bioluminescence. Of course, we know they're tampering with our food and all types of food. This is just ridiculous. 
Um, the Japanese have been messing with mice for a long time. And so there's an evolved mouse project, Japanese genetic modification outfit, splicing all sorts of genes into mice to learn more about how genes extract and express themselves. One of their experiments has produced a mouse that sings or chirps audibly and much more frequently than natural mice do. So they, they, you know, labeled it songbird mice. Sounds very small sounds, but this is just what they're revealing to the public guys. I promise you they're going to, this one is super scary. Vaccinated bananas. Just think about what that says, guys. Vaccine bananas. It's a pun and it's a horror movie for all those like myself, who's anti-vaccination. They're literally genetically altering vaccines into bananas so that you just eat your banana. Um, we won't talk about number seven just because we're a mature audience, but now that's pretty hilarious to me. Um, just changing the, just changing the drive of cows. I didn't realize they had one to begin with. Um, they got medicinal chicken eggs where the yolk comes out with different types of protein because they can actually mess with that. They got chimeric milk, which is interesting. Um, there's not one, there's one that's not on here actually, but there was a, in 2012, there was an entire facility in the United Kingdom that had like 150 cows that were producing milk blood, which is crazy. Excuse me, I said that wrong. They had the cows that were producing human blood and they were using this for like food banks or not geez, food banks for vampires, I guess. I, my words are coming out wrong. Um, they were using this for supposedly for blood banks. Um, so they basically genetically engineered the cows to be able to facilitate human blood so that their body, their huge bodies would produce human blood, which is by volume a lot more than a human. So they could extract the, the blood out of the cows and use it for medical procedures. So that was going on eight years ago. Um, scorpion cabbages. Sounds crazy, right? Scorpion cabbages. So... Imagine this is something that was that was kind of interesting uh, to read about, but they basically take the the venom of a scorpion and they they take certain proteins out of it, the, the stuff that's harmful, and then they put the rest of it into an actual cabbage that's supposedly to make it like a pesticide for the cabbage to make it resilient to insects. So just in case you didn't know, some of your cabbage might have scorpion venom layered on it. Just wash your produce really thoroughly, I guess, when you come home. It's crazy, guys. It's crazy. It's all over the place. It's uh, it is part of the occult, and they try to do. They try to. They can't. They have no chill. They can't just relax and mind their own business. They have to push their religion on the entire world. This is what they do. They've always done this. This is why the Book of First Enoch. Actually, I can't remember the exact verse right now. I think it's in chapter eighty nine, but it talks about how um, the righteous, when when the Messiah returns, the righteous will finally have rest from the wicked um it's because through, all throughout history the wicked is constantly pursuing the righteous and messing with them it's just a part of that nature of the unclean spirits that drives the occultic uh religion so what have we talked about we've talked about a mixtures of scorpion men half men half scorpion half uh horse half scorpion half all kinds of not, you know, half goat, half man. And that's just the ones I covered tonight. Like there's so many other examples in history of having a man that is half of something. There's something else called a manticore in, in ancient history. There's just not a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of information on it. It's they, you know, but supposedly it was part lion, part man. It's kind of like, uh, you know, those big statues you've seen in front of ancient Assyria. Um, and some people would even say the Sphinx, right? It looks like part man, part lion, even though the Sphinx looks like a female lion. Um, ancient Assyria would have like part man, part lion that looked like a, a male, actual male lion. Um, so we have nature telling us that scorpions can be hybridized with other creatures, other arachnoids. We have the ancient world trying to tell us they can be hybridized with men, as well as all different types of animals. We have Jubilees 5 trying to tell us that this was the teaching of the watchers through the Nephilim before the flood, that they were changing the orders of all things on the earth all flesh was being corrupted. And we have in Revelation 9, 1 through 6, a very interesting passage. It's actually 1 through 11. It says, Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to the earth, 
and the key of the bottomless pit was given to him. He opened the bottomless pit, and smoke went out from the pit, like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke came locusts upon the earth, and power was given them, as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were told not to hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only the men who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were permitted to kill anyone, but to they were permitted not to kill anyone, but to torment for five months. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. And in those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, and death flees for them. The appearance of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle, and on their heads appeared to be crowns like gold. Their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like the hair of women, and their teeth were like the teeth of lions. They had the breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots, of many horses rushing to battle. They have tails like scorpions and stings, and in their tails is the power to hurt men for five months. They have a king over them, the angel of the abyss, his name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in the Greek, he has the name Apollyon. Many of us have read this passage before. Many of us have seen artistic depictions of this type of chimeric hybrid creature. Face of a man, hair of a woman, teeth of a lion, flies like a locust, breastplate of some sort, stinger tail. Pretty crazy. Pretty crazy. And they're coming out of the smoke that comes out of the bottomless pit. So we'll get into this as we go into Babylon in the future. I'll get into the interpretation of that and try to show examples of it's, it's all building again, right? We're all building to, um, to get to all the prophecy about mystery Babylon and why there's so many descriptors uh, that people struggle with so greatly. And I have always put forward on this channel. The reason why people struggle with revelation is because they don't know the old Testament, right? They don't know, uh, the law and the prophets well the more you study the old testament in my opinion it forces you to study what is documented history about the ancient world because that was the world they lived in so it, it kind of helps you you know with some ideas of why isaiah 34 is claiming that there are satyrs you know running around i mean why the ancient world claimed that there were um aerials you know this is a, a unique word that's thrown in second samuel 23 that the the lion-like men of moab men that were called lion-like they were called aerials i mean that's supposedly that's an ancient chimera half man half lion same thing with giants right now the world wants to discount all this the world wants to laugh it off and mock at it and say oh this is just fantastical stuff but the ancient world didn't think it was fantastical it was all they talked about they had rulers that they drew with great artistic expression they drew their rulers as chimeras and they called them gods and they worshiped them. It was all over the place. It is the world that is happening around Israel in the Old Testament. It is the world that Yahweh is telling the Israelites, be set apart, come out of them. Do not participate in their ways. Their ways is what's bringing judgment upon them. There's nothing new under the sun, guys. But hopefully this is uh, still gets your mind turning, right? You want to be thinking about Unique concepts. The Bible makes a lot of crazy claims if you don't know history and if you think history was just a myth and just a bunch of stories passed down. But yet there's a lot of people, there's, there's a weird divide in academia where you have people that take historical, paleontological, archaeological, uh, anthropological findings. They take them very, very seriously. And then there's this unique transition from the people that are out actually digging in the field then the, the commentary about what those people find over here in academia, suddenly it's all just myth. It's all just primitive cavemen just making up stories. And you're like, yeah, they're finding bones of giants and all kinds of stuff. If they've ever found a chimera bone, would you ever know about it? Most of us that watch this channel understand there's an academic agenda. Uh, you, you can't express giants and Nephilim and chimeras of the ancient world because it ruins the evolutionary timeline. It ruins the whole theory of, of millions of years of evolution. So, and the fact that they try to claim that we're the smartest people nowadays and people of the ancient world were dumb and they were just crawling out of caves and barely understanding the wheel and all that nonsense. 
all those lies. 